Welcome back to another episode of The Loco Fit Show, where we redefine what healthy means to you. I'm your host, Lauren Conlin, and this week I'm joined by our team mental health consultant, Rick, and we're going to talk about a sad topic, but an important topic, and that is loneliness. And this is something that I think affects people in similar ways, but also very unique ways, depending on their circumstances and how they view interactions. But there's like so many things now um, where, you know, everybody hears this, like we're more connected than ever, but we're lonelier than ever. Mm -hmm. And I would say that I agree like wholeheartedly with that, just given how technological our world like truly is. And we're going to get into some of those topics today. But even down to like, I know people who, I mean, straight up just they, they order their groceries to have mm-hmm. delivered. They Amazon all of their stuff. They work at home. Maybe they even work out at home, you know, and then they're like, oh my God, why am I so like by myself and like mm-hmm. this and that? It's like, well, because you're not doing anything. And I get it. Like a lot of those things are convenience mm-hmm. things, right? Like I'm not against any convenience options because we all need them from time to time. But if every single one of your in-person connections is gone, and you live on your own Mm -hmm. and you maybe have a, like a, you know, you might have a partner, but maybe they don't even live with you, right? Like there's so many different things that I, and I know so many people like this Mm -hmm. and it is heartbreaking to think about it, but yeah, let's get into some of the, I guess, topics on loneliness and what increases it, how, what can we do about it? Because I think anybody listening could probably be like, yep, I've either found myself very lonely before, or yes, I'm currently living in this space. Yeah. I agree with a lot of what you're saying. I think technology is really useful in making things convenient and kind of one of the overall arching themes of loneliness is by making things convenient, technology also eliminates like friction. It eliminates conflict, right? Because it's just easier to load an app and order your groceries and have them picked up or delivered to you. It's easy to go to Starbucks and say, I don't want to wait in the line. I'm just going to order something on on here. And then I'm looking at everybody dead in the camera who does mobile orders. Listen, (laughs) listen, it doesn't make anybody's life easier. And now there is a huge mobile order line. I'm a, I'm an anti mobile order person. If you can't tell, especially listen, I get it at some places. Okay. At the airport, it should be outlawed. There should be no mobile order at the airport. Okay, I'm going to get off my crazy person (laughs) rant right now. (laughs) I get very... I don't think you understand. There will be two people in line, and then I'm still waiting because there's 1,800 mobile orders, and they're all jacked up because somebody ordered it, and then it wasn't right. And Anyways, anyways, wow. Okay. Okay. Whoa, it is too early for this. (laughs) It is too early for me to be yelling at people about (laughs) Um, Starbucks. <laughs> that technology, uh, the, the use of technology eliminates, I guess, friction. It eliminates conflict. It makes things easier. And unfortunately, the byproduct of that is we get lonelier and lonelier because in order to really have experiences and connect with people, we almost need to embrace a little bit of that conflict. Like, for example, you know, we've all been there, right? You get the phone call at like five or six o'clock at night and somebody's like, hey, we're going out, we're doing this. And immediately you start kind of running through the permutations in your head. You're like, well, if I, you know, I have to get up, I have to shower, I have to get ready, I have to put my makeup on, I have to like get my shoes, what clothes, what outfit am I going to wear, like whatever. So there's a lot of effort that goes into that. That's friction. There's a little bit of conflict right there. And our life over the last several years has been about eliminating conflict, eliminating friction, making things systematically easier. Now, it has gotten easier, but to address loneliness we're going to need to go back into that conflict area because it's not something you can't, I mean, you know, the comedian Sebastian Maniscalco, he does this little bit where um, he's talking about Uber and Mm -hmm. apparently you can do like Uber cat where somebody can like order a cat for an hour and somebody brings over a cat and you can like pet a cat (laughs) and he goes through this whole kind of comedy bit with it. And I'm wondering at a certain point, like when somebody's going to do like Uber friend (laughs) Somebody's just going to show up and like, talk to you for an hour. It's a real gamble on who you get. <laughs> what is the criteria for Uber? I don't friend? know. Can you like select like religious person, philosopher? I don't know. We're laughing, but it's like but the like, next million dollar oh idea, God, I but think. But literally. If we, Sorry if, we if I'm come, yelling. We're just, we haven't stopped yelling all podcast about nothing. 
so heated. But so, no, Uber friend. Uber friend. If you, you guys heard it here first, if this is <laughs> if we stop everything that we're doing and we make a quick pivot, this is why. Um, but it, but the conflict thing makes a lot of sense, right? Mm-hmm. Because there are certain situations, like when you are in person, right, dealing with another human being, or not even just a human, like just outside elements, like just things, just life. Mm-hmm. There is potential for more conflict, and a lot of people want to avoid that, but. I mean, I think we can both attest to this, like the best interactions come out of that good and bad, right? Like Mm -hmm. if you did have a really ridiculous interaction with someone like, yeah, it might've been stressful, but like in a week you're going to be laughing about that, right? Mm -hmm. Also now you've learned how to navigate a potentially like bad situation, right? Mm -hmm. And then the good stuff that comes out of it, like the good interactions far outweigh anything that you could ever have in a non-human, like a non-in-person interaction because it doesn't Mm -hmm. have to be humans. It can just be like looking at a tree and like seeing like the depth of it or like the sky or like whatever. I I don't know, something so small or just like appreciating like a piece of art that like somewhere, like Mm -hmm. I don't know. And you're not going to be able to see or experience those things unless you have that prerequisite conflict. Um, It's kind of like the whole idea of like the suffering creates meaning. Like, Mm -hmm. can you have any meaning without suffering? I don't know. Because at some point it's like that a lot of those types of things are very fleeting or they're just not as deep. There's Mm -hmm. not as much depth to them, um, which is a whole, I guess, different topic. But yeah, the loneliness thing and the conflict, the low conflict is is such an interesting thing because like you said, it Mm -hmm. was designed to be easier. But I think it's actually made things harder just in different ways Mm -hmm. like yeah you didn't go to the grocery store but now you had zero human interaction for the day they might have even gotten your order wrong so now you have to actually go in and deal with that you know um and you now have not had any of these positive potentially Mm -hmm. positive interactions that you could have and this is not demonizing grocery delivery like i'm all here for it you know like every once in a while you have to do it um but if your day constitutes of doing nothing face to face or out of your normal environment like, that's why I come here a lot of times, even mm-hmm. though I'm not in, like, I'm in an office, but there's still, like, other things happening, you know? And it's, yeah. like, the idea of, like, okay, I have to get dressed. I have to drive down here. And that could be potentially pretty hazardous, as was this morning <laughs> for both of us. It was, I don't know what was happening in the greater Tampa Bay area. A lot of fire trucks A today. lot of accidents, a lot of fire trucks. But, you know, that was obviously not really the ideal way that I wanted to spend 75 mm-hmm. minutes. But I was actually able to listen to two podcasts that I wouldn't have otherwise been able to do. So, right, like, so there's little things that, like, come out of it mm-hmm. that if we had just completely avoided it, we would have a frictionless life. But we also have a kind of an empty Mm-hmm. feeling life. And I guess that's the feeling of loneliness. It is. So let's kind of, I guess, give a rough definition of what loneliness is for most people. And essentially it's a feeling of not being connected, not being understood, that no one is really with you and that you're feeling alone. Um, that's kind of the the short and long of it really. Um, I mean, there's a lot that can be covered in there. Like there's a difference between feeling connected to somebody and feeling alone, there's a difference between being understood. And if you're not understood, it can oftentimes feel very isolating. You can mm-hmm. feel alone because no one seems to get you. They don't really understand what you're trying to say. They don't know where you're coming from. So you feel lost a little bit as a person sometimes when those things can happen. And I think one of the most interesting aspects of loneliness is it doesn't necessarily have to mean that you're physically alone. Mm-hmm. There's been times, and I've made this comment to you know clients, and clients have made the comment to me that they're, they can be in a room full of people, family, friends, and still feel completely alone. Mm-hmm. And I think that speaks more to the concept of I don't feel understood. I don't feel like somebody is with me. I'm not connected to the people that are mm-hmm. around me. And that's where loneliness really sets in. Sometimes people will associate loneliness with depression. They're very different. Um, not to say that a person who isn't feeling lonely can't feel depression or vice versa. Um, but they are kind of separate emotions and we've done topics on, on depression in the past. So I really kind of want to stay away from that aspect of it. And so it can be, you know, loneliness is associated with depression. It also has, there's low mortality rates, um, on happiness. You mean higher, mortality? Hi, excuse me, higher mortality rates. Like sorry. Sick. Um, yeah. Right. <laughs> Longevity longer, tips. Be alone. Be alone. Um, <laughs> So some of the contributing factors that increase feelings of loneliness for people, number one, the use and increased use of technology. First and foremost, that's one. Um, But overworking is pretty common. 
um, the rise of remote workspaces being away from the office, which removes you from people and interactions um, and isolation, both personally and professionally. You know, we've talked in several podcasts about a multitude of topics, but if we go back to the social media and dating, right, like there's a lot of people now who are interacting with a picture of a person and a, they're texting each other without before they have their first meeting. And it's like dating used to be kind of the opposite way. You used to be out in public somewhere or if friends would say, hey, I'm going out to dinner. I'm bringing Susie with me. I think you would really like her. Come meet her. And so you would show up and you would have this face-to-face interaction with oh this God, person. I, do you, I, I doubt people even do that anymore. I don't think they I don't do. Think I mean, do. I don't think that there's anything wrong with somebody saying like, uh, no, you like know. No, like the friend thing. Like that. Like I, I, like, I haven't heard of that. Like I, It's definitely like, rare. Like an older, an older thing. It's not, I guess so. I'm dating generation. myself <laughs> to my generation. So um, <laughs> No, but that's like a really good, I mean, that makes sense. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? I just haven't heard of anybody who has like I haven't heard of any of my friends who mm-hmm. shared that you know like oh met up with someone or they did that for someone like mm-hmm. I just haven't heard of that being a thing but that would make a lot more sense mm-hmm. so in-person meetings is are so important because yeah like just interacting with like a screen like that is one like once you know someone that's a little bit different you mm-hmm. know what I mean like if I have talked to you a few times I will be able to understand like how you're texting, like we have some kind of background information, like we understand how to communicate now. If I don't know someone, it's so weird to just be like, hey, so what'd you do today? Like that's just like such a foreign concept. And I just feel like that is, it's so shallow. Or as we've talked about on other um, podcasts with like the Narcissist podcast, people will say a lot of times like things that you want to hear or that they think that you want to hear. But then when you actually get to know them, then you're Mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah. Whoa. <laughs> and the idea of it is, is you can be on an app like that and be interacting with two, three, four, ten people, whatever, but have no real connection with them. Mm-hmm. And furthermore, when they meet somebody else, it's very easy to disregard you mm-hmm. and just kind of move on from that space mm-hmm. because there's no real connection. There's no intimacy mm-hmm. with it. And again, so it's kind of like the opposite. Before you used to meet somebody, have a face to face interaction, exchange phone numbers and build a relationship from there. Now, You're communicating with each other, which is essentially through a series of pictures and text messages before you exchange phone numbers and start talking to the person. Mm -hmm. And then the date comes later. So you've, you're the concept of like what loneliness is, is is like I can be talking to five different people, but have no real connection, no meaningful relationship with any of them. And I'm still sitting in my house. I'm still alone. Mm -hmm. I'm still isolated. Right. And so when we talk about like remote work and people isolating themselves, both personally and professionally, I think that's kind of where some of this is going to. You see people spend more time online engaging in Instagram posts and you see them doing more things with social media than they are actually interacting with other people. And so it's like if you're at home and you're creating content, fine, like do your thing. I'm not judging it. But what I am saying is, is there isn't much interaction between people both professionally and personally, learning to isolate yourself through a series of technological advances and kind of like the traditions that have changed over time and how dating might be um, evolving. So there's a lot of different ways to kind of look at loneliness and how it's infiltrating your life. And there's nothing wrong with some of these things. But again, everything in life goes back to how do you create balance with it? You know, any one thing taken to an extreme is usually unhealthy. I'm not going to speak in like in absolutes here, but that's why I'm saying is usually pretty unhealthy. Like if you work out seven hours a day, that's probably an unhealthy thing. Um, you know, if you're drinking <laughs> excessively, that's an yeah. unhealthy thing. You know, so everything is just about balance in life. And I think technology and concepts of like convenience are wonderful, but it has to be balanced against the benefits of connection, of meaningful relationships, of developing, you know, an understanding between two people. And I think that's the part that has gotten lost as we've progressed as a society. And that's why, I mean, like loneliness is definitely on the rise. Like I don't meet a lot of people anymore who are like, yeah, I've got an abundance of friends and family that I, I don't know what to do with. I don't know how to spread my time out. Like it just doesn't seem to be a problem that most people have to deal with. Yeah. And you touched on it a little bit, but like you can be... Loneliness is not just about being alone, right? Like Mm -hmm. you can be spending time alone and still be very fulfilled and not lonely, but you have to balance that out with 
other interactions. You know, you can't just expect to be alone all the time. It's not to say that you have to be with people all like 24 seven and you need to be, cause I think that some people can use that as like another outlet, right? Like, mm-hmm. oh, I'll just spend time with other people and doing a bunch of things, but they're not really like creating or spending that quality time on their own to maybe process things or work on their own things. Mm-hmm. So there's that kind of balance there as well. So it's not just saying like, oh, if you are alone a lot, you're lonely. Like, that's not what we're saying here. Correct. But there are going to be a lot of things where on a kind of a day to day or at least a week to week basis, mm-hmm. you should probably be checking certain boxes as far as like human interaction and just like outside life interaction and that kind of friction. Mm-hmm. So when I was at Huberman's lecture a few weeks ago, he talked about the importance of seeing people's faces, like just facial recognition, even if you're not necessarily like interacting with them, but just like seeing a face, seeing a smile, like seeing an expression, like how, when people are completely isolated from that, like it's mental health really, really deteriorates. And think about that, you know, that person that we all know, maybe like an older person or, um, you know, like the crazy neighbor, you know, down the street who like literally lives on their own, doesn't leave their house, all this stuff. Right. And it's so sad. And it's like this different level of loneliness. And also just like, then you become like not really aware of how to handle yourself in those situations because Mm -hmm. you're like, well, everything now feels really foreign. You lose the skill of interacting. Yeah. Yeah. Like the more that you do something, like going to airports now is an actual breeze. Like, I mean, there's obviously things that are going to happen travel wise that get fucked up, but like the process of traveling now for me is so easy. Like, whereas before it used to be like this whole big Mm -hmm. thing. Now it's like, okay, no, no, I have like, I have everything down, (laughs) like know where to go, how to get there. Like I can navigate almost anything pretty easily. Um, but that only happened because I did that a lot. Mm -hmm. And now there's like a much lower threshold. Now, like the flight could get delayed or something gets moved. And of course that's like stressful, but Mm -hmm. it's totally different than before. I'd be like, well, where, how do I get this? And how do I tag my back? You know, like all that Mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And like, it, you know, you don't do it, then you're not going to have that skill. (laughs) And one thing to really make note of too, is I think the pandemic really accelerated a lot of the problems that were already starting to develop with technology, with being overworked, with remote workspaces. The pandemic literally told people to isolate themselves. I mean, I've made the joke before, like, if only the White House could consult with people who had an idea of what it would mean to isolate people from their friends, their family, their work environment, and how detrimental that would be to their mental health. Like, God, if only we had a group of individuals who could have enlightened them about what the protocols and what the dangers of that would have been. But it is what it is, and whatever happened, happened. And so forcing people out of the office, away from travel, deeper into isolation, away from the gym, away from friendships, away from connections, it creating a life that was deeply embedded in concepts of isolation and kind of solitude. And what really experienced, what we started to experience on a much larger scale was the loss of community that really exists that is necessary for human beings to thrive. You've heard me say in the parenting podcast, you've heard me say in in other ones where I've talked about the community being such a fundamental, important role in the development. Like, We used to have the old saying, like, it takes a community to raise a child. It's not just mom and dad. It was the brothers, the sisters. It was the aunts, the uncles. It was the neighbors. It was the church goers. It was um, the football coaches, the basketball coaches, the cheerleading coaches. It was everybody within that child's life that had a, a role in mentoring and shaping. And when you look at the evolution of human beings, we evolve from incredibly social creatures and we we move in this pattern that is isolating ourselves. So like, look at kids. Like I have a six year old, he goes to school. He's in a classroom of 20 people, like every single day he's interacting. And that's going to be his life all the way through. Let's just assume, I'm not going to assume he's going to go to college. Okay. But let's just say that's the pattern that his life takes through high school. What happens after that? If he goes to college, great, but that's just another four more, four more years of what he just experienced. But those are forced interactions, right? So what happens when we become adults? Well, you get a job, and so you're. if you don't work for a huge company, usually you work as part of a team. And so the 20 people that you interact with, you know, on a daily basis or, you know, moving from classroom to classroom, it moves from 100 people down to 20. And then what happens when you, like, move a job or you take, work, get a job with a startup? Like, as you become an adult, your social circle and your community begin to shrink. 
you're not involved in sports or athletics the way that you used to be. You go to the gym now and you throw your headphones on because, God forbid, somebody comes up and talks to you at the gym, right? I'm here to do work. <laughs> like, I didn't come to socialize. Like, I love that. On the back of everybody's T-shirts, it's like, don't talk to me. It's like, all right, well, fuck off. I won't. <laughs> like, put your headphones on. Be a badass, you know. Like, every woman in the gym, I think they just assume that every guy in there is like, oh, they're just going to come up and hit on me so no one talks to me. So they throw their headphones on and there's like this, you're in a public place, but you're still isolating yourself. Mm -hmm. And so what you see is... Traditional gyms, I would say that, um, you know, CrossFit does a good job of this. Mm. Um, Powerlifting gyms or powerlifting groups within gyms do a really good job of this. Um, They've always trained more as traditional kind of athletes, right? Like you have typically if you're at a powerlifting Mm -hmm. gym or... A group, you know, a lot of times you will all have, you know, a similar ish workout. You know, you're lifting these crazy weights, so people are, you know, together. Mm-hmm. There might not even be like headphones, there's probably just music at the gym, right? Um, CrossFit gym is very similar, you know. Um, I don't, I mean, maybe people use headphones, but typically people are going in there, they have a group workout, you mm-hmm. know, that whole kind of, you know, jujitsu, any kind of stuff like that is, is totally different. I would say that the traditional gym setup is definitely like, fuck you don't talk to me i'm just here to do my shit and you know I'm here to lift not socialize but it dep- it really does depend on the gym like it I, really I look, yeah i'm just giving I it know, a hard time no, but you see I the point know, that i'm I making know. and so as kids we grow up with this huge but, community okay, but like what do we do about that right like like what do you walk up to people hey do you want to talk to me like <laughs> do you want to be my friend <laughs> do you want to be my friend well, do you like, want to do you want to be on uber I, friends it's i this was new uber startup. <laughs> I can Uber you somewhere to talk to another person. <laughs> They're like, bro, this chick's on crap. Well, get sooner or later, you're just going to be sitting at your house. There's going to be a knock at the door and be like, Lauren ordered you a friend for an hour. <laughs> a friend. <laughs> be like, we call these prostitutes where yeah. I'm from. <laughs> no, no, no. My clothes are fully staying on. Fully staying on. <laughs> but that could be part of the criteria. Exactly. What are you in? That's an extra fee. That's Uber friends plus. Yes. The idea of a community is fundamentally important when we're talking about addressing the topic of loneliness. And so I would encourage people, you know, like what are some of the ways that you can start to explore your life and analyze how am I isolating myself, Mm -hmm. right? And what are the things that I've done, maybe career changes, moves that I've made, things that I'm doing in my day-to-day interaction, like that I can do those things. Like maybe I show up in the gym a couple of days without my headphones and I say hi to some of the regulars and I get to know them and just strike up some conversations. You know, there's been plenty of times where people have said something to me or, you know, and just a general conversation starts, you know, it doesn't mean like we're going to exchange phone numbers and go out for coffee later, but it's like, that was a nice interaction. It was five minutes, you know, you get to learn something about that person. Next time they see you, they're like, Hey, how are you? And now all of a sudden you're starting to build a little bit more of a community. And so it requires you to move away from this isolating aspect. And I think this is where, again, when we're talking about the concept of conflict, right? I'm asking you to do things that are going to make you uncomfortable because everything else in our life is designed for convenience and ease and to eliminate friction. Mm -hmm. Well, now I'm telling you that if you want to address loneliness in your life, you're going to want to start moving into the space of more friction and being uncomfortable, being a little bit awkward, maybe having some strange social interactions with people that don't like work out, but later in life you can like laugh about Mm -hmm. it. Um, oh man, that's one of my favorite things about traveling, especially like solo. <laughs> I'll just go and I'll sit like at a bar, either it's like a bar or like the restaurant bar. Um, and I generally enjoy talking to bartenders. Just, I don't know. I just like talking to them, but then you also get to experience like maybe the person sitting next to you or, or whatever, mm-hmm. like a conversation might strike up. Um, and a lot of times it's great. And then there's other times where it's really fucking weird, but that's still to me like a great interaction because like this was weird, but I'm enjoying this and I got something out of this. This is a story. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? This is like a something. Um, and I think that like that is obviously like nothing weird happening, but like a weird conversation, you know? Um, but like part of it, like that's part of the fun. Or you could have been the weird one. You know, like there's plenty of times where I'll say something. I'll be like, oh my God, like, I was I was the weird one or that was super awkward. But then you kind of just move on. And the more, mm-hmm. again, that you do that, the better that you're going to get at it. I mean, I'm still awkward and weird, so maybe don't take any advice from me, but (laughs) Um, this is super important. And I think, too, this is something that I never really focus too much on, but as I'm getting older, I'm noticing like this is probably important, is doing things not just in a community, but like the community that you live in. Mm -hmm. And that used to kind of be like the norm, Mm -hmm. Um, but now with 
just having things more online. And, you know, for me, I've always had an online business, so I've never had like roots, you know, somewhere to say like, okay, like, you know, I'm here, like, this is going to be like, I'm doing things in this area. Mm -hmm. Um, and now I'm like, maybe I should actually kind of focus on that, you know, because I'm very blessed. I have so many friends and colleagues, like all across the country. Like I Mm -hmm. could almost go anywhere and like know somebody, but again, there's a difference of like, that versus okay like on a kind of a weekly interaction like what are what's Mm -hmm. how can i have more connections um and that's hard though Mm -hmm. because it's like oh like where do i go is this going to be weird are they going to like me am i going to like them is this going to feel like a but you don't know until you actually like try that and do it yeah you know and again moving into that space where you're more likely to do those things like you're you're willing to put yourself in an uncomfortable space and be like okay this may or may not work but i'm gonna try it you know you're kind of the you have the type of personality where you're like i'm gonna take adventures right you're gonna go and grab a group of people to go see the hubberman um (laughs) podcast you're gonna take some groups of friends to go say hey i'm going to see jordan peterson talk or hey there's a symposium on this and i'm gonna go do that or there's this meeting Mm -hmm. in this other state I'm going to fly out there. I'm going to tie my (laughs) trips together. So you're willing to do that. Now, there might be some social isolation while you're doing that, like you're traveling alone and then you're going to meet a group of people, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, But you're willing to confront that frictional space, you know. And for some people, it kind of happens, you know, accidentally. They can kind of find themselves in a much more lonely position in life, you know, because they made a career change or they've done something different. Like me personally, um, you know, when I made the transition from working in the jails full time to my own practice, one of the biggest things I recognized was I was like, I'm spending a considerable amount of time alone now. Mm-hmm. Um, like my day, if I see eight or nine clients a day, well, that's like 10, almost 11 hours yeah. worth of consecutive work. But it's like the only interaction I'm having is with my client versus on a screen. Also, on, not on a even screen. in right, person. Right. Yeah, some well, of them some are of in this, person. Yeah. But, you All know, right. before. I would come into the office and I had um, case managers that would come up and talk to me. I had guards or staff that would come up and talk to me. I had other therapists, you know, that I would speak to or supervise. I had administrators. We had visitors that would come into the, we had trainers that would come in and out. And so throughout your day, you had all these different interactions, not to mention the clients that were there in the prison themselves with groups and everything like Mm -hmm. that. And so it went from this much larger community and being a part of a company, something that was bigger than myself to like, okay, now I'm spending a lot more time alone. It's Mm -hmm. just really me and my clients. Mm -hmm. And it's like for hours and hours and day after day. Yeah. And so it's a very different interaction, which means like for me, some of the social things that I do are much more important. Like I go to a gym where Everybody kind of likes to talk and engage and the regulars are all like very friendly with each other. So I get a great social interaction there. I love to train jujitsu. So I go there and, you know, some of the other relationships that I've kind of manufactured through work, like Mm -hmm. I'm calling them more. I'm reaching out to them more. I'm engaging with them more. I'm like, hey, do you want to go to a training? Do you want to do this? But this is kind of the point that I'm starting to make. And this is where it's going to get into how do we address this? The onus is on you. This is not a, this is like, you can say, well, this isn't fair. I don't care about fair anymore. This is like, you're the one who's feeling lonely. The nature and the way to address this is through your interactions and being proactive and you reaching out to other people. If you're sitting back and going, I'm lonely and I'm waiting for everybody else to interact with me, you're going to feel pretty empty. And here's the problem. Most of the interactions we have through social media don't fulfill us in a meaningful way. So if you make a post and it gets 400 likes... Well, there's 400 people who are liking your picture and maybe there's 20 comments, but they're not real comments. They're not engaging with you in a meaningful way. They're like, oh my God, this picture's amazing. Love that place. Wonderful. I visited there, you know, fire emoji, whatever. Rick's favorite. (laughs) Yeah, my my favorite. favorite. (laughs) But it's not like you're sharing a space with them. You're not interacting with them. And so here's what you're going to do if you want to address some of the loneliness. Number one, you have to reach out. The onus is on you to connect with other people. So you need to make the calls. You need to set the plans. You need to take charge of get-togethers. You need to organize dates and dinners and vacations or trips. You're the one who's required to put the effort in. Now, again, do you see why I said this is about re-engaging with conflict? Because this is going to feel awkward. You're going to call your friends. And as we get older, 
again, our social and community network shrinks to the point where the majority of the interactions you have on a daily basis is with your significant other and whatever other family members you live with. Mm -hmm. And so as people get older, they become more isolated. Their family takes more of a priority. So it takes effort to engage people, to go on trips, to do things. And sometimes you may need to be the person who does this. I recently went to a trip to California where I got to connect with two of my best friends who I haven't seen in years because they've been busy. We had a pandemic. They had kids. My, you know, I was building a business or my practice, things like that. So it was like I haven't seen any of them. Mm-hmm. In order for me to reconnect with them, I needed to book the ticket. I needed mm-hmm. to fly. I needed to organize things. Mm-hmm. And so you do it. I'm not saying I'm the perfect model of this, but that's the effort that is required. Absolutely. And it is it is hard because there is the possibility that somebody you know, does reject that or does kind of make you feel like blown off or that you're not... <clears throat> that they don't have enough time, right? So there always is that like potential. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you don't put yourself in that situation, it may or may not happen. And again, that this is something that like, as I've gotten older, I'm like, I have to really make an effort for this. Cause I have developed a lot of great friendships with people who don't live here. Mm-hmm. So I have to be that person who like, you know, Hey, just check it in. Let's do a FaceTime. Let's talk. And it's, you know, like you have to do that. And even with the travel stuff, like none of that just like happens. It's like, I decided to put myself in those situations mm-hmm. because it was like, these things seem important, but let's make the most out of this. And those aren't just like, those things aren't just happening by accident. Like you have to really want this. Um, and I recognize that because literally I, same thing, I'm working all day on the computer with individuals, but at this point in my career, I'm working with them online, you Mm -hmm. know? And it's like, okay, if I could go an entire day without seeing one single person, if I wanted to, or interacting, right? Because even if I did, let's say, go to the gym, I could just train at home. I could literally not leave the house. And some days, let's be honest, that's after like a bunch of traveling or like a crazy week. Like sometimes it's nice, Mm -hmm. but you do that for a few days in a row and then you're like, oh my gosh, like I'm going to go crazy. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's like, no, okay. If I have a few days that I'm at home, I need to come to the office or I need to go to the gym or I need to set up something. Mm -hmm. I need to go to a class. I need to call my friends. Like it's not convenient, but it's like little things like that. Like, Hey, let's go meet up for Mm -hmm. that drink. Let's get coffee. Like let's talk. And those are the ways. And I love how you said that. Like it is on you. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's the whole like kind of extreme ownership mindset. And I think a lot of people, wouldn't really apply that to loneliness. Like people hear stuff like that, like it's all on you, it's extreme ownership. Mm -hmm. They apply that to like business or their relationships or, you know, like, but not their own loneliness. But that's really the only way. The solution exists within you and your Mm -hmm. ability to look at those things. And so I use the example of me moving from a much larger company and community to being more isolated. And so one of the other things that I've done to address that is in the past, I'd been renting an office that I only needed twice a week because... Mm -hmm. I would only see clients in person on those two days. Well, I've now signed a new lease for a new space that I have seven days a week access to just so that I can start to be around other people. Now, they're not like my colleagues where I'm going to interact with them, but they're sitting in a community area where they're going to grab coffee and tea yeah. and every you, you can interact with people. And so for me, it was like I can stay at my house and be completely isolated or I can force myself into a position to be around other people, which is what you did here. Mm -hmm. Like you can do everything you do from your house. Mm -hmm. You know, you've recorded podasts from your living room before. Like it it could be done if you needed it to be done. But the idea of it is, is to say, look, okay, that maybe even costs me more money, Mm -hmm. but I want to be in a space where I interact with people. Those interactions are important to me because I tend to be, if we're looking at this on a spectrum, I'm definitely more of an extrovert. I like to interact with people and not just within a therapeutic setting. Yeah. I like to have conversations. Yeah. And so non-work conversations. <laughs> yes. Um, it's crazy. Wait, you're not a robot. No, I think you don't only want to talk about therapy. Oh my God. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, the major ar- arching theme that I want you guys to remember is in order to address loneliness, you want to step into that space of friction. The onus is on you. It can be difficult. It can be awkward. You can face some rejection. There's going to be challenges to it. But what I want you to really focus on is developing quality interactions. It's not about quantity. Mm -hmm. This isn't about like I've got to develop 20 friends. It's like if you have two or three solid or quality interactions with people where it's not online and it's real life. And here's the other key. How do you know if it's a quality interaction? Are you willing to be vulnerable? 
Okay. Are you willing to share parts of yourself that when you're having a bad day or you're struggling with a relationship or you're dealing with something that's really difficult for you, can you count on that person to one, listen and not judge? And can you be in that space for them as well? That's a quality interaction, which is why I say moving away from online is necessary because people aren't using social media to be vulnerable in healthy ways. Let's put it that way. Most of it is attention seeking, but again, you can post a picture, you'll get a hundred comments about how amazing this picture is or how beautiful you look, but none of that is is happening in a vulnerable space. There's no real give and take. And so it's about quality of the interactions and what is a quality interaction, any space that you can truly be vulnerable in and communicate with people, which is why like our, our friendship is beneficial to me because it's like, for those of you that don't know, like Lauren and I can pretty much talk about everything and have, yeah. Um, Literally, <laughs> you know, and so it's like we get I, I get to get something out of that interaction. It's like we don't just get together and have podcasts like we talk about yeah. like what's happening in each other's lives. I've talked, you know, what's happening in the good, the bad and the ugly and everything in between. So that's a quality interaction for me. And you have other friends that you can do that with. So do I. And the idea is to really kind of focus in on that community and not just rely on your significant other to be everything for you because they can't be and you can't be everything for them so expanding that network into being like okay there's a class that i want to take and i can have some interactions with people on this class or i can go to the gym and maybe it's like hey if i like lifting weights maybe i should join a crossfit for like once or twice a week where Mm -hmm. i can just get some interaction it's a totally different way of lifting or working out fine or maybe do a jujitsu class or a karate class or a yoga class where you can talk to somebody and just interact and have more quality interactions does that make sense absolutely and i think that wraps it up really nicely and you know it is going to be work like anything Mm -hmm. that's important but i do think that there's a lot of times just now people think okay just being around other people is enough but it's like you really have to focus in on not just being physically around people that is one thing but also that quality time um and making an effort because say you do have a great friend who maybe lives across you know the country you know doing regular talks and then scheduling times where you guys get together, you know, is so important. I mean, I know like me, and my best friend, Chanel, if you guys are listening, you know, you know her. Um, she like we don't live near each other, you know, but we will set aside times a few times a year where we will somehow manage to get together. Whether it's she comes here, I go there, we go to an event together, like we plan something, you mm-hmm. know, several times a year. We kind of joke it's like our quarterly trip. <laughs> like we quarterly see each other. Um, and then, you know, it's it, it's great. And, you know, in between that, we're obviously like texting and FaceTiming and not excessively because we're both busy. But then it's, okay, when we do talk, it is about that like vulnerable stuff and it's about like life and, you know, fun stuff too. But mm-hmm. it's, it's deeper than that. So I do think it's possible to maintain, like if you're like, oh my gosh, well, I don't have anybody in my community yet. That's fine. You know, mm-hmm. still maintain those long distance relationships, um, but also maybe try to do more things either in your community or just going out and doing more things, going to an event, going to a conference, um, doing some kind of continuing education for your work. Um, just something that you're fucking interested in. Just go and actually do that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we're all about going and doing things. If you couldn't tell from all this and yeah, this wraps it up. Great. So as always, I kind of made that a weird ending, but Hey, one day, the weird ending is when I send the Uber friend to your house. Yes. (laughs) That's the weirdest ending. I mean, we really, we're going to have to discuss, we're going to discuss this heavily for another hour. You know who I think would make a great Uber friend is James. Nobody's going to James on this podcast one day just oh. so people can get an idea of who this crazy man is. Nobody is going to understand the levels <laughs> to that joke besides the three of us and Jermaine. Okay. Jermaine will get it. Yeah. Jermaine will get it. Jermaine will get it. Um, so thank you guys so much for listening. As always, I will put Rick's contact information below in the show notes. Um, and for more information on our coaching services, you can visit teamlocofit.com. And if you're interested in signing up for our app, which is live and thriving and amazing, um, you can go to redefine healthy app. Dot com. And we'll talk to you guys next week.